All right. Good morning, guys. We're going to go ahead and get started. <clears throat> Welcome. Glad you're here. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. We are going to be looking at the section verses 15 through 6 9. Uh, I want to welcome you all here. Glad you're up. Uh, hopefully our time this morning will be a blessing as we look at this fairly significant chunk of Scripture that says a lot uh, and has a lot of specific application for us, especially as men uh, in this world. And so I'm excited to have the opportunity to teach uh, and lead us through this passage and hopefully we'll have some time at the end to discuss a little bit. But glad you're here. Let me pray for us and we will jump in. Father God, it is really good to be up early around men that love you and want to know more of you through your word. And we confess that is not possible without your spirit. And so, Spirit, would you be our teacher? Would you allow the words of this text to jump off, the words of these pages to jump off um, and to convict us, to strengthen us, to encourage us? Would you form us more into your image during this time as we look at your word? We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So we again are looking at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 through chapter 6, verse 9. I will read it and we'll jump in. <clears throat> Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for this is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God, for the Father, God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in the splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let his wife see that she respects her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling with a sincere heart as you would cry, as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service or people pleasers, but as bondservants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, 
knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or is free. Masters do the same thing and stop your teaching, uh, stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I have four children and a dog and a wife. Some of y'all are very aware of that. And because of that, a lot of my time is taken up in a lot of ways with just carpooling, taking them places, kids' activities. Uh, And you no doubt know about being a parent, being a grandparent, and your schedules being full. And Ashley and I have, Ashley and I, my wife, have tried for years, years to find a date night to continue that gospel uh, instruction to to date your wife, to continue to pursue her and to find time in your schedules to uh, focus on your your marriage. And for years we have struggled to find that time. Well, last fall, by God's grace, we were able to put all four of our kids in school. And so Wednesday mornings just happened to be open, and so we started walking together as kind of our date time. Every Wednesday we we walk for about an hour, and then we spend time praying for our marriage, for our kids. Uh, and it really has been nourishing to our marriage and to our relationship. But early on in this process, I learned that when I go walking with my wife, it's not a leisurely stroll. Ashley likes to walk at a certain pace. She, she picks up the pace, and I had to learn to pick up the pace to keep up with her. Because she's not out there just to leisurely walk. She wants to get exercise. Uh, And so I had to think about how I was walking. I couldn't just show up. I had to show up ready to exercise. Walking is something that a lot of us do without thinking a lot about. We get out of bed and we just walk. We, uh, we, you know, we get into the day. We get out of our car. We walk into the office. We, we walk. Uh, Paul's audience here knew a lot about walking. Uh, Back then, there wasn't a lot of mass transit or bikes or cars or railroads or carriages. They walked everywhere. Everywhere they had to go, they had to exercise, put one foot in front of the other, and to walk. And Paul knows this. And so Paul uses this walking metaphor, and he's used it before many times, to uh, examine the Christian life, to talk about the Christian life. He uses this phrase at least five, four times before our passage uh, and a couple of times after it. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Ephesians 2, 10, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Ephesians 4, one. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Ephesians 4.17 Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in futility in their minds. This whole concept of walking is a metaphor that Paul overlays the Christian life. He's trying to explain what it means to to live out your faith, and he uses the metaphor of walking. And walking requires really three things, if you think about it. It requires rhythm, strength, and balance. You need rhythm for consistency. You need strength simply to move, and you need balance so you don't really fall over. And if we extrapolate that metaphor out a little bit, which I think Paul would give us freedom to do, Um, the Christian life needs rhythm. God is a God of rhythm. Just think about creation. Six days He made things. On the seventh day, He rested. And that rhythm plays out in our lives. Rhythms are important. We call them liturgies. Liturgies of life. You have a rhythm. You get up in the morning, maybe you have a certain, you know, the way you make your coffee, you know, a certain schedule of your day. Every day I get up at 520 I grab a banana, a pre-workout, and I go work out at 6 o'clock. It is a rhythm of my life. 
And we are creatures of rhythm, creatures of liturgies. Uh, we need strength, the strength of the truth of God to uphold us, to hide it into our hearts so we don't crumble under the weight of worldly desires and temptations. And we need balance, we need wisdom, we need discernment to navigate gray and ambigu uh, ambiguous things in life. I love how Tim Keller says, wisdom is navigating 80% of life's questions where the moral rules don't apply. 80% of life's questions that come at you, the moral rules or your morality doesn't necessarily help you. Things like, where do I send my kids to school? Who do I vote for? How do I discipline my child appropriately? What do I do uniquely with my time in this moment? The moral rules, the moral law doesn't necessarily speak into that. We need wisdom. We need discernment. We need balance. And so Paul uses this uh, metaphor of walking to talk about the Christian life, expressing your faithfulness to Jesus. Uh, and what Paul is doing here in our passage from chapter 5, 15 to 6, 9, I think is really, he's created this kind of stick figure, if you will, this sketch in Ephesians chapter 5, uh, 1 through 14, talking about all these things, we should instructions and applications to the Christian life. He says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and verse 2, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Paul's talking about our response to the gospel. Uh, I think Mike talked very uh, well last week about kind of the indicatives of the Christian life and the imperatives of the Christian life. Everything is grounded in God's uh, truths about us, the gospel, right? We are grounded in that, who God is and who we are and what He's done for us. And out of that, He gives imperatives. He gives commands. We don't reverse those. It's not God gives us commands so that we can be this way. He said, no, you are this. You are my children. You are my redeemed people. Therefore, live it out. Therefore, take hold of that. And so what Paul's doing in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 through 14, is he's really creating this vague, I would say, kind of sketch of a lot of the Christian life. And in verses 15 through 6, 9, what he's doing is I think he's coloring in that sketch. He's adding color to it. He's coloring this, the spaces, and he's giving some really uh, specificity to the Christian life as we'll look at the household codes, you know, husbands and wives, uh, masters and slaves, parents and children. So he's p making things very specific. Before, it was very, it was very much, you know, do not give yourself into sexual immorality. Do not give yourself into foolish talk or crude joking. Do not be deceived with empty words. Do not become partners of darkness, exposed to darkness. All these things that God calls us to do, but they're very vague in some sense. So Paul moves into specificity in this uh, passage that we'll be looking at it. So I want uh, you to see really three things. Paul has an admonition, an application, and lastly, household instructions. Uh, the first thing is an admonition. Uh, in verse 15, Paul says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Make the best use of the time because the days are evil. Uh, many of us like college football. Many of us have certain teams we root for. Uh, I have been an Alabama fan for a long time, and I've learned as I've watched football and I've listened to all kinds of coaches talk about football, uh, scouting is very important to the game. You've heard about this. You know, coaches get tapes from other teams, and they watch how the different team reacts to different situations. Like, what does the team do on third and five? What are their, uh, you know, what do they think about what plays do they run, or third and ten, or how do they do these uh, in these situations? What players are in the game, et cetera. And so you have to scout the other team so as uh, you know how to defeat them or, or to exploit their weaknesses. But I think what Paul is saying here and what 
a lot of good coaches understand is that you can't just scout your opponent. You have to learn to scout yourself because you too fall into rhythms. You too have certain uh, propensities in certain situations in a game. And if you're constantly falling into a rut of doing this, the other team can scout you very well. And so we have to learn how to scout ourselves, to be self-aware, to be self-reflective is what Paul's getting at here. Look carefully then how you walk. Scout yourself. Think about how you're expressing the gospel through your life. What are the rhythms and the patterns that you have that draw you to Jesus, that keep you from Jesus? What are the things in your life that you are giving your heart to that you're possibly not aware of? Why is this important? It's because our time is limited. He says, make the best use of your time. Um, Paul wants the, the believing Ephesians to know the richness of the gospel, chapters 1 through 3. He grounds them in the beauty of the gospel, but he also wants to encourage them to faithfully be aware of what's going on around them because the evil one is prowling around like a roaring, roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Not to mention the world and all the temptations of desires of eyes, desires of the flesh, and the pride of life. He says, look carefully, examine how you walk, not as unwise following the patterns of this world, but wise following the patterns of the gospel. Maybe you've had this question asked to you, and I ask it to you this morning. Would you know if you were being deceived? If somebody was deceiving you, would you know it? kind of rhetorical. You don't have to ask, answer that out loud, but uh, some of us might say, of course. I'm not a fool. I'm not going to be deceived by somebody. I know a lot of what's happening around me. I'm aware of my surroundings and relationships and my spidey sense on how people interact with me, and I will never be deceived. But the truth is you wouldn't know you're being deceived because that's the point of being deceived not knowing. So if you're truly being deceived, you wouldn't know it. And so a lot of us in life can be deceived. The evil one is very crafty. The world is very attractive. And there are all kinds of rhythms and practices that we give ourselves to in our daily life that deceive us, that we don't know we're being deceived. We're being lured away from who Jesus is and the truths of the gospel. Uh, I'll never forget um, a guy talking about uh, spiritual warfare and what spiritual warfare is. And a lot of us think about spiritual warfare as like these frontal attacks, like the evil one's coming at us with you know, all his lies and he's got spears and flaming darts and all these things and we think of warfare that way, like frontal attacks. <clears throat> But what the evil one does is he's a master of jujitsu. He's a master of using your own weight against yourself. He's a master of, of, of tempting you and, and causing you to give all kinds of spiritual energy, your relational energy to all kinds of things that are good, but ultimately that cause you to stumble and to trip and to fall and be led away from Christ. So Paul's first admonition is to look carefully then how you walk, to examine your Christian life, to ask yourself, why do I do what I do? Why am I doing this? Why is this a rhythm in my life? Could I be being deceived here in life? So Paul moves on from this admonition to an application. Paul says in verse 17, Therefore, in light of this admonition, uh, he says, Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. The first thing uh, to this application from this admonition is to know the will of 
of God. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. It's important here to, to, to see that Paul used the word understand and not the word to know. They're two different words and two different concepts. To know something in the Greek language is to have an intimate knowledge of it. To know it through and through, to have a personal experience with it. And a lot of us want to have that. We want to know a personal, intimate experience with the will of God in our lives. What do you want me to do? Make it clear. How do I do this in life? How do I address certain situations? A lot of us in this election have asked that question. What is the will of the Lord? How do I vote here? Just tell me. What should I think? But he doesn't use the word know there. He uses the word to understand, which is a different word. It means to contemplate, to think about. Uh, to understand something is to consider it, to roll it over in your head uh, constantly. You see, God has two different, uh, or, or we understand God to have uh, two different wills. God has a hidden will that none of us will ever know. We don't know what God is doing. He's a spirit. He has planned all things, and He is active, bringing about His will in this world, in your life, in the lives of our children. Uh, he has a, a will that we're not aware of. But he also has a revealed will, the will of the Lord that is very clear for us. That Paul makes clear in Galatians chapter 4, verse 14, the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. What is the revealed, the clear, revealed will of the Lord? It's to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself, very simply. That's what God wills for your life wills for my life. And we're to contemplate that, to consider that on a daily basis. How am I loving my neighbor? How am I loving God with all my heart, my heart, soul, mind, and strength in this moment? That is what His will is for us. We are to contemplate it. We want to know His hidden will. We want to know exactly what He wants from us and how to do this and make decisions here. Should I leave my job? Should I, you know, adopt this child? Should I spend my money this way? All these questions we have, and we want God simply to say, do this, do this, do this, and He doesn't do that. He doesn't tell us directly how to do things. Uh, and the reason we want that is because we don't want to live by uh, faith. We want to live by sight. We want it just to be clear. Uh, and yet God has revealed uh, His will, which is to love Him and to love His neighbor. And so part of this application to this admonition is to know that and to ponder it, to consider it. How am I loving my neighbor today? He's, you know, he starts off this section, chapter 5, saying, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave Himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. So to be imitators of love, to walk in love, to love our neighbors, and we must constantly be considering that and pondering that in our everyday life uh, as a way to be watchful on how we walk. But secondly, what's the application to this is do not get drunk on wine, for that is debauchery. Paul here in verse 18, it says, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Notice Paul doesn't say, Do not drink wine. <laughs> We're always quick to point that out. Um, he says, Do not get drunk on wine. Uh, it's important to understand that, that drinking was a big part of this culture in Ephesus. I mean, you know that... The temple of Artemis was there, uh, the, the, the god of Artemis that was worshipped for uh, children and, and few, um, fertility. And so they had all kinds of festivals that they gave to worship her. And every one of those festivals was saturated, saturated with, with drinking and debauchery. 
getting drunk on wine. And no doubt some of these followers of Christ would engage this temple worship and, and give themselves over to alcohol too much. And they would get drunk. Um, and why is Paul not want them to get drunk? Because it's debauchery. I think this is interesting. Uh, the word debauchery means to be wasteful. What Paul is saying here is if you give yourself over to wine too much, and you get drunk on this wine, you become wasteful. If you go back, he says, making the best use of your time. And if you're drunk, inebriated by wine, you're not making the best use of the time that God has given to you to walk in love. And so Paul tells him, you know, to be careful and watch how you walk means don't give, don't dig, don't dig, don't get drunk, don't overuse alcohol because you're wasting the time that you have been given to walk in love and as children of light. But lastly, he says, be filled with the Spirit. Uh, now, this is a phrase that an earlier book uh, that Paul wrote is very um, familiar to many of us. Galatians five sixteen. Now walk by the Spirit. What does that mean? Paul is telling the walk filled with the Spirit. Well, he tells us this. What does it mean to walk, to be filled with the Spirit? It means three things. It means speaking and singing together the truths of the Scripture from your heart. These methods of talking and singing and, and making melody there. It's simply communicating the realities of God's Word to each other. The psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Not just with your voices, not just with your tongues, but with your heart. Speaking to each other, singing together, communing around God's Word. And sharing the truths of who He is with each other is important in walking with the Spirit. Not being alone, but having some people to talk to, to sing with. That's why worship is important as we gather and we sing. We sing together and as a corporate expression of our faithfulness and our love of our God. And it stimulates and encourages us in the Spirit. Secondly, to be thankful. Give thanks always for everything to God uh, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This sense of constantly being thankful for who you are and what God has given to you. Understanding that everything comes to you by His hand is completely of grace. You deserve nothing. And He gives it to you because He loves you and constantly being thankful for that, for all things. Lastly, in submitting to each other... Uh, Verse 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Understanding that we're all in submission to God. We are His creatures. He's redeemed us. He's brought us back. And we're all in submission to Him as His servants, as His vice regents in this world to communicate who He is. And we are to be submissive to each other. To submit to each other means to come up under each other. To think of, as Paul would say, somebody else's interests are more important than your own. This concept of humility, which really saturates the next couple of uh, paragraphs, what Paul is getting at. So first we have this admonition, and then this application to this admonition, to look carefully. What does that look like? How do we do that? Well, he explains it to us, and now he moves on into... The, what he calls the household, or what some people call the household codes. Um, talking about wives and husbands and children and parents and bond servants and masters. And this is where he gets very specific on the applications of God's love for us and walking in love. What's important to see here is a lot of this, a lot of themes in these um, instructions is submission, authority and submission. We see that in husbands and wives. 
this, this sense of the husband as head of the wife and the wife is to be submissive to her husband, the sense of authority and submission. We see that in children and parents. The children are to be submissive to their parents, to honor their parents. And the parents have authority over their children. Bond servants and masters. This rhythm of authority and submission. Now where does Paul get this? Where does Paul get this rhythm? Well, it's grounded in the, the foundation of who God is. Uh, and that's very important as we jump into uh, wives and husbands, as he's talking about this concept of marriage, this institutional, this institution of marriage that's grounded in Genesis chapter 2. Um, <clears throat> Paul is, is talking about and is using these uh, authority and submission kind of uh, terms because God himself expresses himself in our existence in those terms. Let me explain what I'm trying to say. So uh, the Trinity, God himself, uh, existed by himself before there ever was anything, right? In the beginning was God. And so when we think about the Trinity, there are two kind of theological lenses by which we need to view the Trinity. It's very important. One is the ontological or essence uh, of the Trinity, that God himself, before he ever created anything, is, is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. Right? He's not male. He's not female. He doesn't have a gender. He just is a spirit. And in time and space, we can't completely understand, he decides to create. He decides to create and reveal himself to that creation and how does he choose to do that? He chooses to do that through certain roles. You know, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He takes on masculine uh, pronouns. And each person within the Godhead has a role to play in creation and redemption. And so the Father is the author of redemption, the Son is the accomplisher, and the Spirit is the applier. And they're all equally, you know, doing this together, and the Son submits to the Father, and the Spirit submits to the Father and the Son to do the will of the Father. Now, the Father's not greater than the Son, and the Spirit's not greater than the Son or the Father. They're equal, equally God, same in substance, equal in power and glory. And yet, in their expression to help us understand who they are, they take on submissive roles. And this plays itself out in creation. If you have your Bibles, you can go back to Genesis chapter 2 with me. I need to hurry up here. Verse 15 of chapter 2, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Here God creates man, the man, Adam. Chapter 1, I would say, is about really the, the ontological essence of humanity. We are equal before God. Genesis chapter 1, 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. They're equal before God in worth and value. And then in chapter 2, he moves into the roles they will play out in creation. The husband. 24, uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast unto his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So here we see different roles. The husband is the one that's to leave. The husband's the one to take initiative. And what does the husband do? He's the one to hold on to his wife. The wife doesn't leave. The wife doesn't hold fast to the husband. No, it's the husband. It's the man that does that. You ever ask yourself what it means to be a man in this world? What is masculinity? Something I've been processing a lot these days. We're unique creatures, created in the image of God. 
and masculinity is different than femininity. So what is it? I would submit to you that, that masculinity is a responsibility and a priority to, uh, to protect and to work and to lead all of God's creation. Uh, you know, vaguely in all of life, but specifically in marriage. So there's a created order that plays out in husbands and wives, children and parents, and bond servants and masters. And these are roles. These are not uh, issues of worth and value. All right. So wives and husbands. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. So what Paul is doing here is he's weaving these these two metaphors of marriage and Christ and, and the church together. That as the husband is head of the wife, just as Christ is head of the church. There's a sense of authority. There's a sense of responsibility. There's a sense of priority here. That the husband is the head. Now the church submits to Christ, so also the wives should submit to their husbands. Because of this created order, as, Christ, as the church submits to Christ, the wife should submit to the husband. In everything. Uh, now, I don't see a wife in here. <laughs> uh, and so the application here, men, is that you are a responsible head of your family. You are the authority of your family that God has given to you. That is your role. You're not better. You don't have any more worth or value than your wife before God, but you have a unique role in this institution of marriage to be the head, to lead it, to cultivate it, to protect it, right? That is your role. That is your God-given role. Um, and your wives are be to be submissive to that. Now, Genesis chapter 3, as God curses the wife, we see that that's a struggle, right? The, the, your wife will have a desire for a husband, but yet he will rule over you. And so that, that headship, that authority, that ruling, that dominion in the context of marriage is very, very difficult because it's cursed by sin. And so you struggle. Your wives struggle to submit to you. You struggle to love your wives. You struggle to be a representation of Christ to her so that she feels safe, that she does, and she is able to submit to you. And so sin has marred it, has scarred it, and so we struggle but it doesn't take away from the fundamental realities that you as a man, as a husband, are head of your wife as Christ is head of the church. Now, how does that play out? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now, your role is to give everything that you are, all that you have, in sacrificial love to your wife. In every way. To go and to die for her to give your life for her, to love her, to speak the truth to her, to care for her, to be gentle with her, to protect her. Adam was put in the garden to protect it. Right? As men, we have a responsibility to protect our wives, to protect the church, to protect this world from the evil one. You are to protect her, to love her. To sacrifice for her as Christ sacrificed for you. Why? That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her with the washing of the water with the word. Why do you sacrifice for her? Because your job is to cultivate your wife. The number one job that you have, really, in marriage is to give all your resources, all your education, everything that you are, to sacrifice for her so that she is better off because she married you. God put us in the garden as men, the Adam, and said, make it better. Cultivate it. Leave it better than you found it. And guys, when you take a wife, your job is to leave her better than you found her. The way you, you love her and lead her and sacrifice her, causes her to come alive and be the most beautiful woman that God, the beautiful woman that God wants her to be, to sanctify her by, by the word, by washing her, by the, the spirit and the word of God. 
Because you have a responsibility to teach and to develop and to care for your wife and to teach her the Word of God. That she might become more and more beautiful. And this is right, and this is who God made us to be. These are our responsibilities as men. That He might present the church to Himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that He shut, that she might be holy and without blemish. Jesus sanctifies the church. Jesus enters in, sacrifices for her, and one day He's going to offer her to His Father to show the Father, look what I've done. And men, we will do the same thing. When judgment day comes, God will ask you about your wife, this woman that you took to take to hold, to protect, to love. Was she better off because she married you? Does she look more like Jesus because she married you? Is she holier because she married you? And we will have to answer for that. Now we're covered in the blood of Jesus, right? And forgiven, God has forgiven us of all things. But we still will be held accountable for that and hear that on Judgment Day. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. Paul is saying, as you love your own body, you love your wife. No one ever hates your, bo hates your body. You care for it. You think about it. Um, and so we should care about our wife, just so we care about ourselves. And then he grounds it ultimately in Genesis chapter 2. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That word there for hold fast, whenever I do premarital counseling, I always talk about uh, that's an image of bear hugging. When's the last time you gave your wife a bear hug? Like you wrapped your arms around her and you held tight to her and you squeezed her. God tells us that we are to take to us, leave our parents, and hold fast to, to cling to our wife, to squeeze her tight to us as a sense of protection and guidance. And then verse 33, however, let each one, of you, each one of you love your wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. I don't have time to go into this, but why do you think God says that? Why does God say husbands love your wives, but wives respect your husband? It's because we, we both have different fundamental uh, heart needs. And your need and my need as, as men in this world is to have an effect on people. We want to move out and, and we want to create a legacy. We want to leave this place better than we found it. That's why legacy is a big thing for us. We want to um, leave our mark. And when, when our wives look up to us and revere us and respect us, it, t it touches parts of our hearts that uh, are life-giving. And yet, when they don't, it's life crushing. And the same thing for wives. Their desire to be loved, to be cherished, to be thought about, to be pursued, to be sacrificed for, to be protected, to be cultivated. All these things we as husbands are to do. We could spend forever on this, and I'm, I'm almost out of time. So then, children. He goes on, children, I bear your parents to the Lord. This is right, uh, that we should do this. And fathers, do not exacerbate or provoke your children to anger. This is grounded in God's revealed will. Honor your father and mother. This is important, this act of authority and submission, which is grounded in who God revealed himself to us in the, as some call the economic trinity, God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You know, it's it's. Uh, woven into God's revealed will, uh, revealed law, honor your father and your mother. And there's a promise to this that you might go well. Things might go well for you in the land. And so having children that honor you, children that you love to life, 
children that you care about, and when they honor you, it's going to create blessings in your family. It's going to function the way your marriage and your parenting is meant to function. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Do not exacerbate them. Do not provoke them in such a way that they get angry at you, but to be gentle with them, to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. You have a responsibility as fathers to instruct them in the Lord, in the Word of God. It's not the school's responsibility. It's not their grandparents' responsibility, right? It's, it's, your wife is a helper. She helps you with this, but ultimately it's your responsibility. He doesn't say husbands and wives. He says fathers, fathers. It is your job to discipline and instruct your kids, to disciple them, to teach them, to bring them up in the Lord. And then lastly, he goes into bond servants. Uh, this whole... Um, this, this whole system of, of economic flourishing that is grounded, that's part of this society, this bond servants, this is not slaves as we would understand them as chattel slavery, but bond servants are people that um, give themselves into slavery to somebody else to pay off a debt, right? And, and uh, masters were to care for them, to help them pay off their debt by serving them. And so he gives gospel instructions here on how that relationship shall play out. The bond servant should not grumble. He should not complain. Uh, but he should serve with a sincere heart. Verse 6, not by the way of eye service or people pleasing, but the bond servant of Christ. We do it because we are uh, in Christ. We are slaves to Christ. He has bought us with a price. He has, he has paid our debt our sinful debt, and so we uh, sacrifice and live for him, and the same is for bond servants and their masters, and lastly, his masters treat them fairly. Do not be harsh with them. Do not threaten them. Do not um, treat them partially, but to treat them sincerely and to care for them as an authority that you have that's given to you by Christ to love your bond servants, to treat them with love. Why is this important? Well, all these things are important because chapter 6 is right around the corner. The armor of God, which Sean will close out next week, is because the evil one wants to destroy all this. He is aggressively attacking all these different relationships and all these different dynamics. Why? <laughs> because it lessens the glory of God. It lessens the beauty of Christ. It lessens really who God is in this world. And so these relationships are important. Um, let me pray for us. Father, I thank you for our time. We've covered a ton. I pray that the discussion they have around these um, scriptures would be encouraging. And Lord Jesus, thank you for instructing us this morning. Help us to be better, better husbands, better fathers, um, better leaders, better cultivators, better protectors. Uh, and that we would constantly be watching about how we walk in this world, looking carefully on our faith as we express it in our everyday lives. And so, Lord Jesus, be with us this day in Christ's name. Amen. Sorry I ran over.